Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Ray Tampa Podcast. Our podcast offers bold commentary on various subject matters with a laser-like focus on the truth. My name is Ray Tampa, and I'm the host of the Ray Tampa Podcast. We have in our studio Mr. Russell Cato, a retired educator of more than 40 plus years here in Pinellas County. And Mr. Jamie Wilson III, a healthcare provider with more than 25 years as a physical therapist, my dynamic co host. We're pleased to have with us today Miss Karen Mueller. And uh, Ms. Mueller is a very engaged community activist. And she has a wealth of knowledge, wealth of information about the intricate details of the historic gas plant deal between the Ray's Hines Group and the city of St. Petersburg. Ms. Mueller, welcome to the Ray Tampa Podcast. Thanks for having me on today's show. Oh, by all means. Bye. Thanks for being here. Ms. Mueller, we ask, that you tell our audience a little information about yourself, such as where were you born, educated, and a little about your professional background, if you don't mind. You bet. So I uh, moved over to Florida about 10 years ago, and I've been in Campbell Park neighborhood for about three years. Yeah. I have an engineering degree from the University of Washington in Seattle, and for about 25 years, I worked in design and construction of uh, commercial construction projects and infrastructure. Okay. So I was really happy to be, have the opportunity to serve on the Community Benefits Advisory Council because I live in the Campbell Park neighborhood. I'm within the one mile radius of the Tropicana Field. Excellent. Excellent. Well, certainly, again, we appreciate having you here. And uh, what we're going to do is uh, read a little information and then we'll get into the question and answer session, allowing you to tell us what you want to tell us. On April 29th, 2024, the Catalyst magazine published an article written by Mark Parker and titled, quote, what's in the gas plant redevelopment benefits package, end of quote. The first two sentences should give anyone of serious mind reason to pause and reflect. The first sentence says, quote, the city of St. Petersburg released a long awaited historic gas plant redevelopment terms, April 25th, providing stakeholders with critical project details established long uh, long ago through several months of negotiations. Wow, the mayor and his surrogates have been out talking about this transformational project for a long time, when in fact, all the details weren't in yet and the public had no knowledge of the proposed details. Hmm. Still not. The second sentence says, quote, the proposed deal issues some of the Community Benefits Advisory Council's affordable housing recommendations. The key word is issues, which means to deliberately avoid, evade, or shun. So the question is, why would there be an attempt to avoid including everything in the report? Failure to do so could suggest deceit. Deceit. Ms. Mueller, if you don't mind, we're going to uh, refer to you by your highly recognized nickname, Carrie. Are you okay with that? You bet. Carrie. Carrie. Gotcha. All I right. It. I got it. Carrie. So at this point, Carrie, when did the Community Benefits Advisory Committee first begin its work 
on the plan? The first meeting for the Community Benefit Advisory Council was on January 9th. Of this year. Mm -hmm. Okay. And next question. At what point did you all conclude your review and submit your recommendations? The last meeting was supposed to be on January 30th, but we added another week. So we concluded on February 6th. Okay. I want to back up. When did you start again? January, January 9th. January 9th. And your last meeting was supposed to be February 5th? February 6th. 6th. Mm -hmm. So that's one month. Yeah. Five, five total Tuesday nights. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. Five total Tuesday nights. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And you submitted your recommendations. We did. Okay. Um, from your perspective, since you were on the committee, was there an intentional effort to evade publicizing the recommendations about affordable, affordable housing? I think that everyone was waiting for this most recent report so that we could understand what recommendations were included mm -hmm. with this development agreement. So we all were aware of it as the same time as the public became aware of it. Okay. So, and from my understanding, the public became aware of the report on the 25th of April, mm -hmm. 25th of April. Mm -hmm. Now keep in mind, 25th of April was just what, a couple of weeks ago? Right two weeks ago, but they've been out there long ago talking about how great this deal is and how transformational this deal is and what a great thing it's going to do for this city, but yet all the details aren't even out yet. NAACP executive committee voted on this, <laughs> talking about all these positives and the final report was not even put out yet. And the thing I want to point out is the NAACP's executive committee voted on this matter, not the full body. Mm -hmm. So the executive committee voted and the media ran with it. NAACP says this and NAACP says that, but the body hadn't even voted, just a committee. That's like a small committee in Congress voting on something. Right. And then the media coming out saying, well, Congress said they're going to do this. And Congress is all in favor of this. No, a committee said that. But nevertheless, that's just the way it is. Um, I want you to talk to us about this housing uh, component of the deal, because supposedly... Uh, there was an effort to avoid putting it in the report. So why don't you talk to us about it? I think it's helpful to understand what they originally proposed as far as the number of housing units within their project, which was 1,200 affordable housing units. Mm -hmm. And it's important to break down what that what that covers as far as income levels, because they're anywhere from 60 to 120% AMI units. Okay. So what people really want to hear about are units that are at 60 and 80%. AMI, because that's what the general population considers to be affordable. Okay. The rest, you could almost consider them to be workforce, and they're getting close to market rate. Okay. So out of the, the 1,200, uh, originally with 1,200, they added 50. So let's just say 1,250. We had uh, 600 that would be on site, mm -hmm. but only 200 are less than 80% AMI. So only 200 units are considered to be affordable housing mm -hmm. that will be on site. 200 of the two on site, right? but there might be another 200 or more off site. Right. So it, the breakdown for uh, the units for 60%, there's a total of 300 with some on site and some off site. 80% is 350. 100% 100 is 100 units. And then there's 500 units that are 120% AMI. So that's a pretty high income restriction. Okay. So those get to be pretty expensive. For most people in St. Pete. Well, you know, you're right. Sometimes it's very confusing because a lot of people out there don't know what AMI means. They mm -hmm. don't know the percentage breakdown, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I want you to give me an idea. Let's say I'm one of these elderly individuals 
who um, is in need of housing, affordable housing. And I'm looking for one bedroom, one bath units. How much on a monthly basis can we possibly be talking? I think when you're talking about someone who's on a fixed income, whether they're a senior or they're on disability, they maybe have an income of around $1,000. Correct. And they're probably only going to be able to afford a 60% AMI unit. Okay. So mm. that just goes back to the fact that there's only 100 60% AMI units that will be on site. Okay. It's very wow. small number. Very small. And uh, if they're only uh, bringing in $1,000, then that means uh, about 600 of those $1,000 going to have to go toward housing. Mm -hmm. Wow, wow, wow. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, from the standpoint of continuing the discussion about housing, has it been decided where these units are going to be placed in the acreage exactly? There's four different parcels that these units will be placed on, and the uh, city of St. Petersburg will retain ownership of those parcels. And I believe they're deed restricted for that income restriction for 99 years. So after that, then they'll revert to market rate, okay. I believe. All right. Let's make sure we understand that deed restricted four parcels, 99 year mm -hmm. deed restrictions. Mm -hmm. And those are the parcels that will contain those units for the people that are in need of serious help. Serious help. Yes. Okay. All right, well, let's talk about another area of this uh, benefits agreement. There's a lot of talk about the $50 million that the Raise Hines Group is supposed to be giving to intentional equity concerns in the city. Intentional equity, whatever that means. <laughs> $50 million. Do you have any idea how that is going to be broken down? Because it's not like they're going to just say, here, it's $50 million. It's going to be structured over a uh, a whole long period of time. Right. Okay. And the one thing I want to bring up about the 50 million in intentional equity, when we uh, had our neighborhood meeting for Campbell Park, mm -hmm. we had Brian Ault come and do a presentation mm -hmm. about the community benefits for this project. And that was when they brought up the 50 million in intentional equity. And even in that very early meeting, what stood out to me is that that is actually a payment in lieu for the land. So they, instead of paying us for the land, they're setting aside the 50 million. So it's not really a gift from the developer. It's really this public's assets that will be allocated and distributed by Ray's Hines. I'm so glad you clarified that because that's exactly what I've been saying all along. They're not going in their pocket pulling out nope. $50 million. Nope. Nope. Hell, I'll do that if you give me uh, a piece of property that's worth six hundred million, mm -hmm. and I only have to pay a hundred and five million. I'll break you off. I'll <laughs> break you off a little, and that's what we have going on here. Ray's Hines is giving back, supposedly, giving back to the residents fifty million dollars. Um, but look what they're getting. And we all know the biggest community benefit that the public is expecting and hoping for is affordable housing. Right. That's what everyone That's what said they, at every single said. meeting. And people came to the Community Benefit Advisory Council meetings, and they sat there for hours. And we're talking three or four yeah. hours mm -hmm. that they sat there mm -hmm. after working all day so that they could bring in their three minutes of comments about what was important to them. Three minutes. Three minutes. And some people couldn't stay. So some <laughs> right. people never even got an opportunity to speak about what was important oh, to them. Man. How many people? I think there were nine, but... Be uh, certain for me. I'm nine. Be nine people on the uh, benefits committee. Right. There's two ad hoc members that were voted in, myself and Debbie Reeser. And then there was standing members. And then there was members that were appointed by the mayor. Standing members. I want you to know, fellas, Deborah Fig Sanders, one. <laughs> <laughs> Another one is Esther Matthews, two. <laughs> you know her, too. And uh, if Mayor Welch dropped his handkerchief, they're going to bend down in a hurry to pick it up for him. That's right. mm -hmm. I should have said that. Let me back up. That's not right. Probably. Maybe just say that they have 
biz, they're representing business interests. Yeah. We could leave it at that. Yeah. I, I could get behind that. Oh my God. I'm so yeah. apologetic to what I just said. But nevertheless, can you tell me who else was on the committee? Of course. So we had Brooks Wallenford. He's with the Chamber of Commerce. Did a really great job working really hard to try to get some rental assistance included into the benefits package. Debbie Reeser is with the Edge District, and she's working very hard to try to make this good for the community. And we had uh, Gloria Campbell, who you know has been active in the, the community for years, mm -hmm. and established the Clearwater CRA. It's a very accomplished community advocate. Mm -hmm. Uh, and Esther Matthews, Jason Mathis, head of downtown partnership. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had uh, Deborah Fick Sanders and we had Bruce Neeson and Ruth Whitney, who had previously served on the CBAC. Not surprised. It's not my job to be negative about people. And I'm going to say uh, the two names that I mentioned, uh, I do apologize to the two of you. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. Let's move on to another area of that $50 million. Um, can you identify some of the discussion areas as to what they want to do with that money? So one of the things that we voted on as a, as a board unanimously was to index the $50 million to inflation. Since it's going to be distributed over decades, it's really only worth $32 million mm -hmm. if you look at over through 30 years. So we asked for that to be indexed, and that wasn't something that was included in the agreement. Um, so unfortunately, that is the other thing that we asked for was the penalty to not build the affordable housing units to be increased. It was originally $25,000, and we asked for it to be increased to $175,000. Because we all know with the cost of construction, materials, and labor, mm -hmm. and land, a unit costs around $300,000 per unit. So we are asking for something closer to what it actually costs to build because at this point, they can pretty much write a check and not have to build the affordable housing. Exactly. Exactly. And, 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 oh. and one of our previous guests told us this. Yes, yeah. yeah. that's correct. And uh, he mentioned that there was a number of $25,000 mm -hmm. per unit. Right, but you all increased it from twenty five thousand per unit to one seventy five. That was our recommendation. The recommendation. It was not included, but they said that they did respond because they did increase it, but they increased it to fifty one thousand. Wow. Oh, so that could be the reason for them trying to avoid the housing discussion. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a way to say that they took into consideration our recommendation because they did increase it. But they increased it to fifty one thousand. So, I I thought that article in Catalyst was very well written. Mm -hmm. I think Mark is a brilliant writer. Right. And one of the things that he spoke about was the percentage increase, mm -hmm. which is one hundred and twelve point five percent. So he went from twenty five thousand to fifty one thousand, and at the year twenty forty seven, it goes to seventy five thousand. However, if you look at the percentage of what it costs to build a unit versus what the opt out amount is, we started with eight percent, twenty five thousand. And we went up to 25%, which is still quite low compared to what the cost of building the unit is. Right. And I, so I think it's really important to focus on the bottom line. Do either of you want to ask a question? Uh, it's just, it, it, it seems that they're feeling forced to even acknowledge the low income um, part of this, this contract. It's something they really don't want to do. Right. And that's, the, that's what this is all about. Well, a major, a major part of it, you know, the low income and, you know, like, like the information, like they had the information in the public, we didn't get it in the public for, for a while. It's like, they just want to brush over it right quick. Mm -hmm. They don't want to, they don't want to discuss details or anything. It's, it's not something that they're, I don't think it's one of their major focuses at all, but it's about the residents, the people here. Is there anything else you want to tell us about that $50 million? Well, just going back to what you were talking about with the communications is in the beginning, we were all in, under the inspect, expectation that this project was mainly going to provide some affordable housing, right. the, the right. main benefit. And during the CBAC process, that conversation changed and people started saying, well, this project was never about housing <laughs> or the housing that we're not going to be able to meet all of our housing needs with this project. So the, the tone of the conversation changed. And I wanted to go back to January 11, mm -hmm. when Welch, in a St. Pete Catalyst article, the title is Welch Revisit Plans to Redevelop Tropicana Field 
with focus on affordable housing. Mm -hmm. And he said, the proposals, the two proposals are both very strong, but I want to see more in terms of truly affordable housing. Mm -hmm. I think we can set the bar higher. So that's why the public has that expectation is based on statements that were made. And then I also want to bring up the previous development that was under the previous mayor, mm -hmm. Midtown, had 1,800 affordable housing units. So we've actually gone down from mm -hmm. 1,800, we're down to 1,250. So I, I don't really feel that we're meeting our goals or the promises that are made, and we haven't even moved toward voting on city with city council. Wow. So we were at 1,800 housing units with Midtown. Right. And... We dropped down to twelve hundred. Right, and then they added fifty added. back in with our recommendations, so they could say, "Well, we added another fifty, so we're at twelve fifty. Okay, it's another piece of that fifty million dollars. Who's going to decide how the fifty million dollars are to be spent? Who makes that decision? I think that's a great question, and I served on that board for five weeks, and I do not have an answer for you. Yeah. And, and I'm glad I asked it. I'm glad you responded that way because that's how most of us feel. Nobody knows, but most of us, most of us have an idea of who's going to be in control of that money. And it's the same damn people all yeah. the time. Same damn it's people. too much secrecy. I mean, this, this, as the information, information comes, we should get it. It's just too much secrecy. Just like, like you said, accurate information. We should right. get it. We should have information mm -hmm. on where this is going to be spent and by whom and how it's going to be allocated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, Ray, let me say this, and I go back to what Dawn said in our previous meeting. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about Ray Hines, that's the development group. Mm -hmm. My concern is why ain't we such a rush to deal with these people? Because in 20, I think it's 2027, they're going to be gone. Why? Why? Just take our time. We don't have to deal with these people. Yeah, we all have, have a, have a... yeah in 2027, they're going to be gone. They're, they're over. Right. Then you answered your own question. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. That's why they want to get it done. Yeah. Get it so done. Why, why are we dealing with them? Make their money and... Well, Russ, I... Um, giving too much. I personally feel that we do need some type of development over there. Yeah, we, we definitely but need that. We but need not, to have not a, not a contract. A, yeah. We need to have a contract that is a win-win, not so lopsided in favor of the Rays organization. And we're not going to get that, right? Well, we're no, not we're not. We're not unless the city council... Uh, <laughs> They go bend the city council. Right? Why do we what need to is? give so much That's away to saying. special interests you or these developers... Money. All right, let's talk about the land. We talked about the stadium. We talked about the fifty million dollars. We talked about housing. Let's talk about the land, the uh, acreage mm -hmm. that the city is giving to the Raise Hines Group at such a discount, and it's such a big discount. Tremendous. People call it a giveaway. Mm -hmm. It is. What can you talk talk to us about that? So. First of all, I would say that this is the highest offer that we have received from the land. And I'm not saying it's a fair offer, right. but I'm just saying that that's the justification that you're going to hear based on the purchase price. But also, let's talk about the appraisal that was done on that land. And that's mm -hmm. two or three years old at this point, And it was for $279 million. So wait, we're going to receive. Wait, wait, wait. Go I, ahead. I never heard that. Before. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, there was an appraisal yeah. three years ago. Mm -hmm. Three years ago, two hundred and seventy nine nine million. Yeah. Wow, that's a low that's appraisal. Very low. But nevertheless, go ahead. Well, the question with the appraisal is what comparables were used because it's a big site, so it's very difficult to appraise because there's not a lot of comparables like it. So it, it's one of those things. Is a big gray area, but at the same time, we got to remember that we're also contributing one hundred and thirty million dollars of public funds infrastructure. for infrastructure. So if they're paying us 105 million and we're giving them 130 million, <laughs> right now we're paying 25 million. Now they're gonna give us back 50 million. So now we're back in, in the black at mm -hmm. 25 million. But does that seem fair that, that's... for prime real estate downtown? No. Now we had a guest, I don't know if you uh, had an opportunity to, to see the interview, but he mentioned that 
uh, he brought forth some comparables and the comparable suggested $20 million per acre. And it was not acreage in a vast amount, but he might have had this plot of land and that plot of land or this acre of land or this half acre of land all came out to be in the neighborhood of about $20 million per acre. So if you take $20 million and multiply it by the number of acres involved, it comes to in the 600 million range. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that um, that's probably going to be your, your high end because those parcels already have infrastructure. They already have water and sewer and roads and electricity mm -hmm. and all kinds of things. But at the same time, there's got to be a middle ground. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not worth nothing. Right, 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 right. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, all mm -hmm. good. Well, have you had an opportunity to speak to Mayor Welch ever? I have not. I have not requested a meeting to talk to him. Um, I know that some of our um, colleagues have and unfortunately have not been able to get a meeting. Some of your colleagues on the committee. Advisory yes. committee. Well, some of my colleagues that we have a group of individuals who are advocating for a better deal. Better. So, deal. so one of those individuals who's been active, and uh, we were previously on the WMNF show, and she's asked. She has a background in journalism, mm -hmm. Lynn, and she's asked for a meeting, but she has not been able to receive a meeting. Hmm. Keep that in mind. Oh, she's asked and has not been able to get a meeting, and that's what our podcast suggested. Mm -hmm when we slammed Ken Welch Before. about not responding to people in the mm -hmm. community. Mm -hmm. Not too long ago, I'll say uh, maybe a week and a half ago, I received a call from a reporter asking me if I knew a certain developer and uh, I didn't know the name. And she went on to tell me the name of the person and why she was calling me. And uh, I suggested that she call another individual from our community because that person might know the developer she's asking about. But the bottom line is that developer supposedly gave big money to Ken Welch, mm -hmm. supposedly gave big money and supposedly got some of his friends to donate to Ken Welch. That's and not surprising. And <laughs> that developer definitely voted for Ken Welch, but could not get a call back from Ken Welch. What kind of stupidity is that? Could not get a call back. There was a, a, a highly well-known, I'll say it this way, well-known uh, homeowner association president called me yesterday talking about all the efforts this homeowners association has been uh, attempting to get a meeting with Ken Welch. They can't get a call back from Ken Welch. And yet there were some people critical of our podcast holding him accountable for this type of stupidity. We'll do it again and again. Well, I hope they've been educated since the, since that podcast, because it's, it's the same rhetoric. He's not, he's not available. He doesn't yes. want to be a bill. Question. Well, <laughs> there were nine of you. Two of you voted against the deal and seven voted for it. And I'm going to uh, suggest that possibly you were one of the two. I was. I just want to clarify. We voted that the community benefits were adequate for the proposal. Mm -hmm. And I voted that, no, I did not believe the community benefits are adequate compared to the substantial amount of public investment. Excellent. I agree. Excellent. Oh my God. That's, that's exactly the way it should have gone down. But I will tell you, uh, Carrie, you've done well. And I'm certainly pleased that you came and brought forth information to us. It's a situation in our city that we can only hope and pray that the city council will ask for renegotiation of this deal. And as I look at the different city council members and try and analyze where they might be, it's going to be a close vote. It's going to be a close vote. 
So with that being said, we thank you for being here. And um, we're at that point, fellas. I want to thank my two co-hosts for the job they do each and every week uh, for the Ray Tampa podcast. I want to say thank you to our listening audience for tuning in to the Ray Tampa podcast each and every Tuesday evening, 5.30 p.m. on 99.1 uh, FM, The Bird. Carrie, you want to say something? I just wanted to send out some information on a Zoom meeting that we're having on oh, Monday yeah, night. Do that, do that. For the next five weeks at 6 p.m., it's open to the public, and it's an opportunity to go through the development terms, the new agreement, and break it down so the public has an understanding of what city council is going to be voting on. And if you just go to nohomerun.com, we have information about with the Zoom link right there. So I really hope people can attend that. Thank I'm you. glad you did because I did bring the report by Alan DeLau. Alan DeLau is a former city employee, high-level city employee. He wrote a report okay. condemning this project, yeah, condemning the Ray's Hines City deal, and he was a former city employee. Mm -hmm. And all of his comments have references to individual sections in the development agreement that's accessible on the Committee of the Whole Agenda on the City of St. Petersburg website, and you can verify whether his comments are actually there or not and see it for yourself. Okay. All right. Once again, go to home, nohomerun.com and get the information about the Zoom meeting and any other information about this project that you would like to have. Once again, thank you, Carrie. Thank Thanks you to much. our thank uh, co-hosts. Thanks to our listening audience. And with all that being said, good evening.